yeah. on the meeting, right? No, this meeting, but she's the ready? secretary. And I am ready. Right. Oh, the right. secretary can't. It is um, 5.30 p.m. on June 9th. We're going to go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. Um, Scott McGarry is joining us remotely today. Hello, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yes, greetings. Greetings. Oh, he's on you're, mute. You're muted. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, thanks. Thanks, thanks, on, thanks yeah. very much. Uh, yeah. I'm showing him on mute now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's interesting, but. <laughs> <laughs> just to be in my office figure out on Teams. It is not as hard as you. Yeah, it's it trickier. Yeah. Unfortunately, oh. we don't have a choice in what we do. Yeah. <laughs> No, I know yeah, my nephew does use Teams and they yeah, said, well, we testify down to like enrichment and stuff. That's but right. Well, like, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, I can, yeah, I can kind of hear Scott. I think it might just be one. Can, 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 can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 We can right, hear you. Thanks for hearing all three of us. Okay, so. um. Should be good. Um, okay, so um, the agenda is up on the screen now. Um, welcome to everyone who's joining us um, via Teams and also in person. Um, so the first order of business is to adopt the minutes from the previous meeting. I so move. Okay, and I will second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and see. Okay, so the next order of business is election officer appointments. Yes. So. Driving it from there. Okay, so we have 30 new election officers to appoint. Receive a list from either political party for this appointment cycle, so they're all being appointed as independents. Um, here is the list of election officers and their precinct names. And some of these individuals, um, Alexandria is not having a primary, so we have a handful of people who want it. It's all the same. Yeah. So we have a handful of people who are coming up from Alexandria who want to work for primary. Okay. So. Yeah. Yes. They okay. are interested in ranked choice voting. So. Oh, yeah. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> I gather from what you're saying, there's no problem with non oriented residents. Yeah, any you so any if you live anywhere in Virginia, you can be appointed as an election officer or anywhere. You have to be a registered voter in Virginia. That's the requirement. And my preference would be that Arlington residents would get preference yeah, over Arlington, but obviously if we're short, I'm not against Well, as you can see, we only have two not Arlington's on there. Okay. That's what those are, though. Okay. So, uh, my wife see right here yeah. on the list. Okay. Yep. I, I am fine with this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make an, a motion to approve the um, election officers for, thank you. I move that the list of election officers provided by provided be appointed for a term commencing immediately and terminating on March 31st, 2024. I second that. Okay. And so now that we second that, I just want to say for um, both Democrat and Republican parties, um, they are being appointed as independents because we haven't received the list. If at any point any of the people on this list if they've reached out to you, you've reached out to them, and they and they decide their preference. Please come back to us with that information. Okay. All right. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah. And Aye. Aye. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Scott. So, and just I did receive a verbal request from the GOP to get a list of people that they had sent us about who had been appointed and who they were still missing applications for. So I do have that for you. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
so. and, and I'm sorry, yep. are you informing them that they can uh, affiliate with their party? Yeah, they get this. With, with the new one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and um, I do, because I had a conversation with somebody and from the GOP who said, like they just weren't sure who had been nominated, what names they had put forward and which names they hadn't. So I have not, like I said, we have the information for you tonight. We have not, yeah, because it was a verbal request, not a written request. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move into an update on early voting and ranked choice voting education. Yeah. So I want to start with we are in the final days of early voting. Um, so far, this data is as of yesterday. Um, this does not include the number that we have today. Do you know how many we have today? I don't know. Okay. Um, it was around 180. Around 180. So we are at around 2,200 people who have voted early so far this election. Um, so we do publish the data daily using a data dashboard. Um, it's the dashboard, the link is data-dashboard.arlingtonva.us slash photo turnout. Um, and once again, this is updated every day with the previous day's numbers. Um, we have also received 3,025 mail ballots back and we will begin processing those mail ballots I'm um, starting on Monday. So also in our data dashboard, there's the chart that we have to the right there with the green bar graph. Um, we do a side by side comparison um, so that you can see how the Democratic primary this year is comparing with the Democratic primary in 2019. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but the green bars indicate 2023 and the yellow beige bars indicate 2019 and our numbers are significantly higher. Um, than they were in 2019. In 2019, we didn't have our first day where we went over 100 was actually the last Friday or the, this day before the election. And we have gone over 100 um, pretty much every day for the last two weeks. So, yeah. so it is a significantly higher turnout in early voting this year. So that's, that's good. I like to see those numbers. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so just a uh, quick update. So this Saturday, yes, is when um, Saturday morning. Correct. Yeah. So we'll be opening up three sites tomorrow. We'll be opening uh, Madison, Walter Reed, and here at 9 a.m. Um, and they'll be open until 5 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and once again, we'll be open on Monday through Friday here next week. We'll be open at the satellites Tuesdays and Thursday, um, starting at 2 p.m those days um, and then the last day to vote before the election is that Saturday, June 17th. Um, I know it's a three day weekend, but we will be here and we will be open. Um, so that will be the last opportunity to vote early before this election. Madam Chair, I'd like to add my compliments on the dashboard. I've shared it with a good number of people who find it very impressive and helpful and I've been checking it regularly. So I appreciate Gretchen your Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions about turnout voting? Okay. I'm curious of the 9,900 ballots mailed. Yep. How many of them, if you know, were mailed because they were on the permanent list and were mailed right at the beginning? And how many have come in? for people individually wanting to vote in this election? So that is a really good question that I do not have data for today. Uh, it's only going to be a guess. I think around 8,000 were on the permanent absentee ballot list, which means that we had around 2,000 requests for this election. Um, once again, this doesn't include, we had another 107 requests today. Today was the last day to request a mail ballot. Um, so we'll be sending those last 100 out tomorrow. So, but the, most of those are individual requests for the selection at this point in time. But we will, we can easily get that data for you, Rich. I... And also when you do your excellent post-election analysis that you always provide, one item I would like to see is you've always listed the number of people who put uh, ballots into drop boxes. I would like to see perhaps a breakdown of say, how many were put into drop boxes more than 10 days before the election and how many in the last 10 days? Yes, we can do that. Like that that's a number that I do have, is how many have come back through the drop box. 
as of today. So, yeah. Good question. Um, Gretchen, I think in the past you notified everybody on the permanent absentee ballot list that they have an option to remove themselves from that. It was has, has that been sent out this year? It, yeah, so we um, do that in before the election. So, like I said, in that 60 days in advance of the election. So, okay. that was, yeah, that happens significantly. Yeah. So that was done before the, oh, before Once, the election, not the primary. Yeah, like I said, it was done sometime in February or March. Um, and once again, it's specific to the Democratic primary. We'll do another postcard mailing in November for all of those individuals who are on the permanent absentee ballot list for the. Well, one of the bigger questions we've had is pretty much, I would say daily, we get somebody calling who thinks they're on, they are on the permanent absentee ballot list but they aren't on the list for the Democratic primary. Okay. And so we're having to, because um, permanent absentee balloting list is still new, so people are still learning about it. Um, so we're having to help them either switch to be on the permanent absentee ballot list for the Democratic primary or help them request a ballot only for this election. So, because both there are two different forms depending on what, they're, what their preference is. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. We did, um, prior to mailing ballots, we do remove all inactive voters who are on the permanent absentee ballot list, so none of them received a ballot. Okay. Yeah. So. And the Francis Boyd Yeah. Next. Okay, so the overview is today we have conducted 21 outreach events um, from April 12th to today, um, June 9th. We have materials available in four languages, um, English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Korean. Um, we have digital boards running at all counting facilities, that's yeah, with ranked choice voting information. And we have created two facilitator toolkits that can be used um, for community members to go out and run their own workshops for ranked choice voting. And I would like to take a moment to recognize we have two um, residents in our community who have really done a rock star job of doing outreach events um, as community members, and that's Michael Shea and Chris DeRosa. Um, they've really taken the materials that we have and um, <coughs> gone to um, civic association meetings and all kinds of meetings um, helping uh, educate voters about ranked choice voting. So. I want to say I have not heard any of the citizen presentations, but I have heard some of yours, and I think you are doing a very good job with your Thank presentations. You. Very good. Very good. I, I yeah. want to um, echo what um, Rich said about the great job that you all are doing. And Chris, thank you. And Michael, I don't think Michael's on the call, but also a big thank you to Michael because I've seen his announcements that he's been doing them. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. Thank you all. I know resources are limited and you all are busy trying to run an election as well as students. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for that yeah. and for that facilitator tool. It has been really, really useful to explain it. Yeah. So, and all of these materials, all the flyers, everything is available on our website. Um, if you go to vote.arlingtonva.gov and you click on Ranked Choice Voting, and then you click on the green button, you can get access to our education outreach materials. And once again, you can print out any of these flyers, post them in your community. Yeah, take them to those and assistance. So. Madam Chair, I want to offer my thanks as well. Um, the material have been excellent. I've shared them with the legislative committee leadership of Viva because of their very strong interest, which in which I spoke when we were at our uh, annual meeting, and also my compliments on the great job that Tate did last night, incorporating the ranked choice voting workshop into the election officer training. Uh, Joey also felt it was first class. We were very pleased that our first choice of our ice cream chocolate um, was the Minister winner. Um, we <laughs> enjoyed, seeing, enjoyed seeing the process played out, but it was it was very good, very well done. Thanks. And so and um, so and election officer training has started. So how has that been going so far? Mm -hmm. Election. We are actually almost done with election officer training. We only have one uh, day of training left next Tuesday. Okay. Um, so it has gone well. Um, 
Yeah, and so every election officer, bulk of the training is focused on ranked choice voting and specifically helping voters understand the process and making sure that every voter does understand that process before we give them a ballot um, so that we can, yeah, make sure voters understand how their ballot will be counted. Great, and, and so, what time is that training? The time for election officer training is, you're, they're usually 3.30 and 6.00. I have a plan to be at least one of those two. Are they in the county board? They are at Central Library Auditorium. Okay. Next week. And I am pulling up the training sessions now. It's Wednesday. Sorry, Wednesday the 14th. And we have one at 3.30 and one at 6, both in the Central Library Auditorium. And they, you know, both of them are uh, for new and regular workers. I'm, I'm going to, um, Rich, I'm going to, um, 10 to 6 p.m. Well, I work on Wednesday, so yeah. I think I will be there. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Next thing on our agenda is uh, logic and accuracy testing, which we did yesterday. Mm -hmm. And all of the machines behaved, right? Yeah. So, what logic and act? So, yesterday the electoral board met to do logic and accuracy testing. Uh, so they tested all scanners that will be used in precincts on election day. Um, and some of the questions I've had about logic and accuracy testing from uh, the public recently are um, one of the, so this is one of the questions was, do we test tricky ballots? And I think the answer is yes. Um, we test ballots that are overvoted, undervoted, skipped rankings, all of this one things. Because we want to make sure the machines kick back the ballot and then they'll accept it and then they'll tally it the way that we intend it to be tallied or that we think it should be tallied when we make a manual review of the ballot. Um, and so that is that is a, a regular part of our logic and accuracy testing for every single election. Okay. And I had actually requested this item on the agenda with the thought that this would be discussion that yesterday we would be testing the taking of the yep. little uh, parts out of each yep. uh, computer and putting them into the other computer, but I gather that we're going to do, do that demonstration today rather than yesterday. So yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. So if you guys are ready, I thought tonight we would do a public demonstration of that tabulation software. I have a demonstration lined up, so I'm going to take over sharing my screen here. And Okay, let's see if it comes up. There we go. Unfortunately, you guys have to deal with my incredibly small um, font size, and I apologize for that because um, I don't have a way of making it bigger. Um, so, um, so the software that we'll be using to tabulate the ranked choice voting office for this election is called RCV Tabulator, Universal RCV Tabulator. Um, it was approved by the Department State Board of Elections last Tuesday at their state board meeting. Um, and we did get our certified official copy of the software uploaded to um, our secure computer today, um, which is um, secured with our other voting equipment. Um, and it did pass its acceptance testing today. So, um, so how this software works is I'm going to load an election right quick. Um, and this is very similar to what it will look like election night. Okay, so I created this, and once again, I apologize for the screen size. There's no way for me to zoom in. Um, but so the way the software works is the first thing we do is we enter a contest name. So today we're doing demo 6-9-2023 and the contest date of 6-9-2023. Next, you go to the tab where you, this is where you upload the different files for ranked choice for all the different um, scanners. So every precinct-based scanner will generate its own file. Um, once again, that um, file is encrypted, so it's going to be taken to uh, another tabulation computer to be unencrypted. Um, and then we'll get a, a thumb drive removable media with all the election files from that computer. Um, to bring over to our secure tabulation computer. So how this works is, uh, well, you would choose the, sorry, it's a little, so we, our files are in CDF, which means common data format. Um, you navigate to the path on the thumb drive to bring the file over. 
um, you need to enter the contest ID, which is in the data file. Um, our contest ID name, it's, it'll be on the tape, um, but it's member county board dash RCB parentheses one slash three. Yeah. Um, so I've already added one file in here um, for the test. So this is, and like I said, it's a little hard to see, but the way the files are identified is, is, is titled OBO UBS 019003, and then there's a long serial number. So what that stands for, OBO is the Open Elect Voting System, UBS is the Unison Voting System, so that's the scanner number that the data file came from. So every scanner has a unique serial number, and this is how we'll know uh, which scanners have been uploaded. Uh, we've already created a checklist that has been approved by the Department of Elections um, to make sure that every file will be accounted for as we go to upload them individually. Um, so we would add all of the files here um, after the election. Um, next, we um, add the candidates. So our demo, we have, um, if you're a fan of Bravo, you might recognize some of these names. Um, but we have Sean DeRimes running, Anthony Garcia, Brandon Lynn, Adam Fitzgerald, Bill Johnson, Christopher Dash, and Kate Chastain. Um, once again, this data has to match exactly as it's in the data file. And our ballots, the candidate names are in bold. Um, that is a state board recommendation. The candidate names appear in bold on the ballot. And the way our software does this is they put in the HTML bold tag. So that's what that parentheses B parentheses means. That's just an HTML code. Quick question. So the question, the file you're working with here would be the one that has been decrypted yeah. from the media file. And yeah. I just had a quick question. There's special software that you have to decrypt? It's proprietary, so the Unison software. I see. Yeah. So yep. then that's on one computer, then it'll be encrypted and it'll be taken to another computer yeah. to do this. Yes, correct. So um, we've added in all of our candidates for our demo election. Next, you go to set the winning, winning rules for the election. Um, once again, all of these winning rules are set in accordance with the tabulation rules that were once again approved by the State Board of Election last Tuesday. So we're doing multiple winner, um, allow multiple rounds per winner. Um, we have a maximum number of candidates that can be ranked at three. And then we have the number of winners that we're looking for is two. Um, when we get to a tiebreaker, we're going to have it stop counting and to ask us which candidate they would need to eliminate. So if we do end up with a tie at any point in round tabulation, um, according to the rules, the electoral board will need to determine by lot which candidate is eliminated. Um, so at this point, when we do tabulation, it'll pop with the prompt, and that's when the electoral board will need to be assembled to pull a name out of a hat to determine which candidate moves on. Um, and then um, according to the tabulation rules, um, we want to use the top um, calculation method, which is um, the, so the threshold formula that we're using is the number of votes divided by the number of seats plus one, and then you add one to that, and you disregard the remaining fraction, and you want to go out to four decimal places. So that's what that number four down here, once again, if you can see it. <laughs> um, so the next thing, we the next tab is we're going to enter in voter error rules. So if uh, we do see an overvote on a ballot, um, according to the tabulation rules, we wanna skip to the next ballot ranking. And then if we have, um, we're only going to allow one consecutive skipped ranking. Um, once again, that's according to the tabulation rules. So essentially if somebody uh, only voted for the third column, um, that ballot would not be allowed because you're only allowed to have one skipped ranking. Um, for that one, it's unlikely with our ballot, but once again, the software is built where you could rank up to 10 candidates. And so if you voted for your first three and you voted for your last three, it's going to disregard anything after more than one skip ranking, if that makes sense. Yep. Okay. Yep. Next, you set the output folder for where you want the file to go. Um, and then you just do a simple validate to make sure everything is entered correctly. Down here, there's a lock screen where you can see validation is completed successfully. 
And then you can do tabulate. And then like that, oh, we've got a tie. So at this point, this is when the electoral board would assemble to determine by lot. Um, so we're, we always choose, we're gonna eliminate Brandon. And we've got, we've got a tie again. So we're gonna eliminate Adam. We've got a lot of ties. And then, yeah, and then. So, for, so the tie would be, these were the candidates who had the least amount of first place mm -hmm. votes? So yeah, let me pull up. So what happens is once we complete tabulation, the software creates two files. Oh, sorry, let me share the screen right quick. Sorry, stop sharing. Oh, look at those people. I know. Oh. Hello, Mary. Let's try again. <laughs> Maybe it's gonna take some time. There we go. And this one I'm happy to report I can actually zoom in on. So what it does is it produces three files. Um, one file is an audit of everything that I ran, um, and that's that audit trail that every voting machine needs for an election. Uh, the next file it produces is a JSON script, um, which is just uh, what we're looking at in this table, um, formatted in uh, code that can be uploaded to a database, and then it gives you a spreadsheet that looks like this. So um, once again, Where's my cursor? Okay. So I'm um, like, let's see. Um, so you can see our winners are Anthony Garcia and Kate Chastain. We have a threshold of nine. I don't like her. Okay, so so one of the the controls that we'll be looking for election night to make sure we've done everything correctly is we want to know that the total number of votes cast equals what we were expecting from the, all of the results shape. So that's one of the first things we'll be doing looking for when we open up the results to make sure that we did add every voting machine and every file that we were looking for. Um, so that's not on here. So once but this is Excel, we'll just calculate that real quick um, by putting in a total field. But as you can see in the first round, um, Anthony got six votes. We had a lot of ties there at four, and then a lot of, and then we've got the two, Brandon and Shonda. So after I selected Brandon to be eliminated, um, his two votes, he one went to Anthony and one went to Christopher. So you can see they gained a vote in that second round. Um, the next candidate eliminated was Shonda. Um, so if you feel like determining by lot which candidate doesn't go forward, I think it's important to mind, remember that they might, they only had legs enough for one more round in this scenario. If that, um, the last leg, in other words. Yeah, yeah. so Shonda's two votes. Um, one went to Kate and, no, two went to Kate, sorry, two went to Kate because she jumped up from four to six. Um, when we got to the fourth round, um, we eliminated, okay, so we had a tie again, and that's where we eliminated Adam Fitzgerald. So when Adam was eliminated, two of those ballots became inactive, meaning there were no more ballot votes, rankings on those ballots. Um, and then two went to Anthony Garcia. Anthony reached the threshold of nine. So Anthony was declared the winner in round four. Um, in round five, um, the candidate eliminated was Bill Johnson. Um, so let's see. Sorry, I have to scroll back and forth. Bill is the fourth name down. So his four votes went to nobody. They were all inactive. Um, so the next candidate eliminated was Christopher Dash with those five votes. Um, and after Chris was eliminated, there were only two candidates left standing, and that was Kate. So even though Kate didn't hit the threshold, um, she was the last candidate remaining um, to be declared the winner in round seven. So that is how it will work. And so you can see tabulation. We run tabulation with a pretty large uh, number of test ballots, and it does move pretty quickly. Um, but then all the results, all rounds are released simultaneously. Okay. So nobody got a, had to do a surplus fraction. Yeah, this scenario didn't have a surplus fraction. So well, that surplus fraction work we did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and we can I do have other scenarios on here. Um, Frank, if you just bear with me, um, we can pull up 
just this is always one of those don't cry when you see my desktop because it always gets okay. also that second candidate one didn't actually meet the, the threshold but it was because they were the only one they're the last can left, candidate left oh, yeah and while Gretchen's pulling this up I just want to make sure that everyone is aware that um, what you're going to see on election night just like with every election night are unofficial results mm -hmm. um, the results are certified by the electoral board the following Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, and and at, that's after all of the mail and ballots have come in on Friday at noon. Um, the state has checked the voter records just to make sure that everything is clean. Um, and then we get that information back from the state. Yes. My understanding is that election night only the first round tabulations will be posted. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And part of that is because, uh, well, I, I have the timeline. Is that the next slide that I have up? On the presentation. Sorry, I am, what's funny is I don't actually, so I have the files from where we ran it, but I do not have, the funny part is I don't actually have the, um, the summary from when we ran it. Maybe I can load this election. Hold on. Let's go into my other RCV test eight. We've done this a few times. No, it's not there. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry, I don't have any of my other test runs saved at this point in time. A follow up question on Chris's. Mm -hmm. So, you won't actually, on election night, you won't actually know the total number of votes. No, we so won't. You, you won't be able to determine your threshold. Right. So, how do you, so what do you, how do you frame that when you're, when you say, when you announce those results? Preliminary, I think the threshold gets determined on Friday, maybe. Yeah, you after don't after don't don't all, all, and then all the provisional ballots. That come yeah. in at Reinhardt, yeah. If we want to go back to, I'll talk about the timeline because I do think that's the next slide. <laughs> okay, so the post-election activity timeline um, I put together and uh, the electoral board will all be getting a copy of this. So we will start the canvas process um, on, sorry, it's not 620, it should be 621 at 8 a.m. We obviously are not going to canvas the election on election day. <laughs> like, that, is, that is a mistake. That was optimistic. Um, being, clicking on my <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, so I will, we will correct that before I post it, but, um, yeah, so the canvas starts the day after the election at 8 a.m. And what the canvas is, is we start opening up, uh, the paperwork that the precinct sent us and we start, um, proofing to make sure everything is in order. The number of voters checked in looks somewhat close to the number of voters ballots that were scanned. All their paperwork got filled out if they're if they need to sign anything or if there's any things like that um what we'll also be doing during the canvas for this election is we will be creating um this master checklist of all the data files so we will know we will know the machine numbers that were assigned to each precinct and we will get from the tapes um, the number of votes that we are expecting when we upload them into that system so we're pulling that information not just from the TM, but also from the paper record that was created election night by our precincts. Does that make sense? Um, so we'll let so we'll start pulling putting together that master checklist for tallying this ranked choice voting office um, during the canvas. Uh, the canvas does essentially extend for several days because it'll start and then close. It's a hurry up and wait game. So yep. Uh, the canvas is always open to the public um, in every election, um, and it will be start in uh, Bosman Government Center in room 317. 
Um, also, the day after the election, the Electoral Board will meet for the provisional ballot meeting. Um, this first meeting of the provisional ballot meeting is a hearing for any voters who cast provisional ballots. Um, they can attend that meeting and um, uh, state their case or provide any evidence for why their ballot should be counted to the Electoral Board. Um, at this meeting, uh, the Electoral Board generally adjudicates all ballots that we can do that day. Um, there are not many ballots that we can adjudicate that day, historically, um, because a bulk of provisional ballots cast right now are cast for two reasons. The number one reason is a mail ballot. So they requested a mail ballot and they did not bring it to the polls with them. We have to wait until we close out the mail ballot precinct before we can accept those. Um, and then the other reason are the same day registrations. Anybody who's registering to vote on election day, those ballots are held until we can turn determine that that person is a qualified registered voter um, and they um, voted to cast their ballot in the correct precinct where they live. Um, so once the access to the provisional ballot meeting is authorized, um, only the political party and candidates um, can send uh, authorized observers to that. Any public that's in attendance who has issued a provisional ballot can show up with their lawyer if they wanted to. Thankfully, we've never had anyone show up with their lawyers. <laughs> so, um, so what, then on the Thursday after the election, um, we will start to begin uploading the precinct files. I'm recommending a noon start time, but that is subject to the electoral board's approval and how they feel about things and where we are in the process. Um, so what we will do is that um, Thursday is when we will remove the thumb drives. These um, thumb drives are secured and sealed in an envelope by precinct selection night. So um, I have requested access from the clerk of the court to be able to access these thumb, thumb drives so that we can tally them. Um, so hopefully he grants access. <laughs> hopefully the state grants access. But um, uh, so what we will do is we will um, break the seal on those envelopes, upload them to a computer. When, when we upload them, that computer does show how many votes are on that thumb drive. So this is where we'll be working with our checklist from the canvas that we created the day before of how many votes were cast in each precinct. Is that correctly being uploaded into the system? Um, and then, um, so we'll do that for all the precinct files. We'll reseal those thumb drives after we process them so that they, that chain of custody is maintained. Um, and then, and then we'll get those over to the clerk of the court. Um, uh, we don't think this process will actually take too long to upload the files. Um, because it, it, we, we can actually do five at a time and it does move pretty quickly. So, yep. So they'll stay at the election office through Thursday. They won't go to the clerks and then come back. Um, it's a, like I said, it's a conversation we'll have. We will do what the clerk wants us to do because they are in his possession. So, but um, we can, the electoral board can hold on to canvas materials throughout the length of the canvas um, if the clerk deems that appropriate. So it is the clerk's decision. So, yep. So we will do what the clerk tells us to do. So, um, yep. So once again, because that uploading precinct files is an extension of the canvas, that process becomes open to the public. Um, after Friday, um, we, oh, sorry, the day after the election, we will begin processing what I call post-election mail ballots. Um, so we do receive a large number of mail ballots dropped off at precincts on election day. Um, so we will start processing those mail ballots at 3 p.m. on the day after the election so that we can get any um, any of those last remaining mail ballots and we can upload those so that for those first round results so that it might change things um, in the process. Um, once again, we accept mail ballots through Friday at noon. So uh, we will continue processing mail ballots that we received after the election, um, kind of off and on until Friday at noon as they trickle in. Um, that process is authorized to any candidate observers um, in a primary, and that will take place in Bosman Government Center 317. 317 is the mail ballot processing room across the hall with the big um, glass wall. So even if you aren't authorized to be in the room, you can always watch from outside the room. So, yeah. Um, and then also on Wednesday, sorry, yeah, Wednesday, I will start assigning voting credit to voters who voted in this election. Um, this is something um, that I am being asked to do soon, so I just threw it on there. So, yeah. Can you explain what voter credit is? 
Um, I will, yeah, yeah. So when you vote, when you show up to vote on election day and they check you in on a poll book, they're giving you voting credit for this election. So that data um, has to be once again manually uploaded to the state system so that um, when you go into the state system, you can see if you voted in this election. Um, so that's not something we usually do so soon after election, but um, there, yeah, has been a request for the list of who voted in this election already. So the sooner we can make that information available to the requesters. Yeah. So. So, so uh, Gretchen, the upload precinct files, that would only take place <clears throat> if there's not two winners uh, after. Correct. The so if yep. there were, by some miracle, two winners the first yep. time, then, then that would be moved. Yeah, if, if two candidates cross the threshold election night, mm -hmm. uh, once again, we're still, if we have to wait until all of the ballots are in before yeah. we can establish the threshold. But once again, if it's a blowout and we've got two candidates that come in with 40% of the vote election night, um, we will not be called at calling the election. We will count every valid ballot that has been cast in this election. Um, but what you will see is a lot of the press or candidates start to call the election. So. So, yep. One more quick question on election night. What will be um, published, publicized? Is the just all the first choice votes or the first, second, third? First, first choice. Just first choice votes. Just the first choice votes. They would, others would not even be available if you haven't opened up the thumb drives. Yeah. Yeah, right. yep. yeah we only will have first choice votes available. Um, yeah. And so when we get to final tabulation, this is a question for the board to discuss tonight. Um, so um, the one thing on there I didn't talk about was same day registration. So uh, we will begin processing the voter registration applications immediately following um, the election, uh, but we cannot begin counting any of those ballots until every same day registration in the Commonwealth has been processed. Um, because all of every jurisdiction needs to enter in the same day registrations. They tell the state when they are done entering in those registrations and they run a data file to make sure nobody has tried to vote in more than one jurisdiction. Um, so the electoral board um, cannot begin accepting same day registrations until that data file has been run and we ensure that nobody has tried to vote more than once in the state, um, which means we can't start running the subsequent rounds until um, I did talk to the state and we are completely holding on to when these other jurisdictions get their work done before we can do our work. Um, so so that is just, and yeah, and so they, they won't tell me a time because they can't. Well, you've got Fairfax or somebody. Who's I will say we've only had four or five same day registrations so far. And we would get, I think our record was 40 a day last fall. So the numbers are much lower, not, like not even comparable to last fall. So hopefully that is what the rest of the Commonwealth is seeing. So, so the question is, and the question I did receive from one of the campaigns is, when will we do tabulation and how will we notify candidates that we are beginning to do that tabulation process that <laughs> I just showed you? So that's the question for the board. Do we want to try to set a time or do we want to establish a communication method where we give everyone an hour to, to make themselves available if they wanted to come watch it? Um, yeah. I think it's unrealistic to set a time in advance given that you are so much beholden on what yeah. happens beyond our control. And I think giving people a number where they can they can yeah. leave a number with us and we'll contact them. That's probably the best way to go. Yeah, okay. So I will reach out to all of the campaigns and if the party could do that as well, just sometimes double communications helps to provide us with contact information if they would like to be notified of when we intended, when we think we will be able to do the final round of tabulation. We can notify them when we start processing the provisional ballots because that will take an hour or two to open and run those through a scanner. So once that's done, we'll be able to run the final tabulation program. Does that make sense? Okay. John, you have a question? Yeah, I had a question on the uh, Canvas 621. That's not going to be constant 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. You said it was stop start? Yeah. And it may not run until the 26th, right? Yeah, we have until the 26th to complete the canvas. So people were going to come and watch, they may not have anything to see. They, you know, so it sort of catches, catch can. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, 
Um, and the other thing that we do do to keep candidates um, informed is we do post on social media how many outstanding ballots we have. So we'll post, we report election night, how many same day registration provisionals we have, how many mail ballots are left outstanding, how many we think we got. Um, and so we are trying to keep the candidates informed about how many outstanding ballots there actually are to come in this election. So, yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions? I have a minor suggestion. Yeah, of course. Um, my experience is that on election day at the polls, people show up with their absentee ballot, mm -hmm. and usually the instruction that they are given, you have a choice. You can either put your absentee ballot into this bag, or you can just throw away your absentee ballot and vote regularly. My suggestion is that they be told it's better in this election uh, you can do it either way you want, but it's better in this election to ballot and vote at vote a real ballot. Because my understanding is that there are not a huge number, but a, a, a significant number of absentee ballots coming in where people have voted first choice for more than one candidate. There's no or very very difficult to try to correct that. Yeah. All of those ballots will be thrown out. Yeah. I think it would be better to tell people, if you vote at the polls, we'll catch that if you make that mistake. Yeah, if you but feed your ballot through the scanner, then there's a validation yeah. in there. Um, we have almost completed election officer training, Rich. <laughs> so we will, have to, we will have to email that communication out to the sheet. Um, we, do, we do try to not, uh, we, I, I don't like to encourage voters, I present voters with their options. And so we can certainly add that option, say, like, if you run it through the scanner, there's, yeah, it can catch any mistakes that might be on the ballot, but um, we don't want to necessarily encourage them one way or the other. Because if they come in with a fully marked ballot yeah. and they just want to drop it off, then that is, that, yeah, yeah that is their right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think it's, I think that's, that's fair, because I was thinking about that too, to offer that an option A yeah. and option B. Yeah, but to still leave that up to the voter on what they want to do. Yeah. Um, but we will add that to the list of things. <laughs> as, as Rich, I'm sure you're aware, there's always a long list of last minute, and here's everything that's changed since you attended training. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. And yeah. Sorry, will there be a, 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 a number of the, the mail in ballots that are like? Example that Rich gave, but in terms of the mail in ballots that are processed in the mail in ballot processing, how many are eliminated because they didn't, uh, mm -hmm. that would have been rejected during the normal voting, and yep. they, and, or they would have been given another chance? So would we find out how many? Yeah, so that is one of those items that we will probably end up including in the post election report is the number of, so, and just to let everybody on the call know if they don't know this already. But when a mail ballot is rejected by the scanner, so let's say somebody voted um, for two candidates in the first column, it will be rejected by the scanner. Um, and this is the same process anytime a ballot's rejected during the mail ballot process. Um, at that point in the process, we've already separated the ballot from the voter, so we don't know whose ballot that is. We cannot contact them. Mm -hmm. But what we do is that ballot is held until election day. And at noon on election day, teams of election officers um, look at that ballot and try to determine voter intent. Um, the state board just updated their guidance on um, uh, in determining voter intent, and they included ranked choice voting in those new guidelines. Um, so if they can determine voters intent, like maybe they did make a mistake and they and the election officers agree that this is how the ballot should be counted, then um, that ballot will be counted the way that voter, um, the way the election officers um, feel they can determine voter intent. So that would be more like they didn't feel it, it was just a really faint thing. You know, but if they actually do vote two people first, there's a there's the the the, the voter intent um, instructions. They were right. pro provided in the state board uh, meeting packet for their last meeting on March uh, May 30th. It is robust. It is a 20 by 30 page document of examples of you can count this, you can't count this. This is a valid mark, that is not a valid mark. So it's not, they are given pretty strict guidelines on what to accept and when to accept it. So. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
Yeah. Yeah, but once again, all of those ballots, when we're doing our sessions, we will know, we record how many ballots are kicked out for hand counting as part of that accounting process so that we don't lose ballots along the way. So every ballot ballot will get counted. Thank you for that um, update. So like now we are on, I think we're on list maintenance, yes? Yeah. Okay, so um, I am actually gonna share my screen again. Actually, we'll talk about this slide for half a second. So, um, and then I'll show you guys where these things are on the state website. So um, list maintenance is has been a topic of conversation recently. Um, I did want to make the public aware that the Department of Elections publishes a list maintenance report that they prepare for the General Assembly um, annually. They have been doing this for several years. In that report, they identify the number of list maintenance activities the Department of Elections does that year, how many voters they identified with that list maintenance process, and how much that process cost um, the Commonwealth. Um, in addition to that report that is published annually, um, registration statistics for each locality in Virginia are made available monthly. Um, so to date this year, um, Arlington, I didn't put the total number of voters that we've canceled, um, but we have canceled 24,000 voters who have moved out of Arlington. They moved elsewhere in Virginia. Um, we've canceled 3,100 for inactive, um, 656 deceased voters. Um, a couple of months ago, there was uh, they were looking over the data that they got for the Virginia Department of Vital Statistics, and they identified a number of voters who had been missed in previous list. Um, so we did get quite a number of vote deceased voters to cancel during that um, month. Um, all of them have been canceled. Um, we do get deceased voter lists week, uh, weekly. That is by law. Um, we've canceled 18 voters for felony convictions. Um, no voters for mental incompetence. Um, this is a very rare case. We will do one or two of these a year. So it does not happen very often. Um, 479 cancellations from out of state. So these are states who have sent us notification that a voter registered to vote in their state and they indicated that they had previously been registered to vote in Virginia. Um, and they will send us official notification to remove that voter from our rolls. And then we have 3,000 who have been canceled per choice. Most of the per choice cancelizations come from people who have gotten jury duty notices. So they get a jury duty notice, and that jury duty notice does tell them you are on this list because you're a registered vote in Arlington. If you want to not get called for jury duty anymore, cancel your registration. Really? Yeah. So, so that is where those per choices are coming from. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Is that the only way you can get called for jury, jury duty? Is your yeah, the list, the list of reg the list of jurors does come from the voter registration. <laughs> So, so from the Department of Elections website, elections.virginia.gov, um, I can make this screen bigger. You guys see that I have very tiny font on my screen when I look at it all day. Yeah, not much. <laughs> That's why I have glasses now. Um, so if you click the results and reports um, link, um, the annual voter registration uh, reports are here. And once again, you can see they go back to 2013. Um, so you can really track the evolution of list maintenance activities over the last decade um, if you uh, want to. And then the registration statistics um, and those reports. So you'll go into the year. And once again, it's there's a whole list of reports available. You can get them in PDF or CV, uh, CSV. Um, and the I believe it is the locality statistics report that is the one, yes. So this is, let me make it bigger. This uh, is on the left. That's yeah, this is the Department of Elections website. So once again, you can see for every county, um, the number of voters that have been added. So a re-reg is a re-registration. That's somebody who's already been registered to vote and they just fill out a new application. New is somebody completely new to that county. Reinstate is somebody who was canceled who you're bringing back. Transfer in is somebody transferring in from another um, locality in Virginia. A change in is uh, similar. Um, that can be a, somebody's name gets updated. Change outs, you'll see the subtraction is the same. Change in, change out. Trans out is transferring out of the jurisdiction. 
Reg purge is um, when an inactive voter is removed from the rolls because they have been inactive through two federal elections. Um, deceased is obvious uh, felony, um, mentally incompetent. Uh, reg error is what you would imagine it to be, a registrar's error. We are known to make mistakes yeah. every now and then. Um, as you can see, there are not too many in that column, thankfully. Um, out of state, per choice, and then other, and then it gives you the net change and out and the total number of registered voters. And once again, this is one of the many reports available so that you can track um, the number of registered voters in each precinct. And like I said, these are published monthly. So, yeah. are there any other questions about this maintenance? Rich, Frank, did I get them all? Okay. <laughs> read, the, read the annual report from the Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> All righty, so now we're going to go into closed session. So I move that the electoral board um, go into closed session pursuant to state code section 2.2-3711-A for the purpose of discussing issues related personal related to personal matters not related to public business. Personnel matters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. Personal, 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 yeah. personnel matters. <laughs> Can I ask a question that I forgot to ask before? Yeah. Yeah, we're okay. still we're still on. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um you send those postcards to people who were on the permit and I I yeah. got one. Is that required? No. So we pay for that. Yes. How much did that cost? Should we I don't <laughs> We don't need to do that. <laughs> so it's um, not a law that we do that. Yeah, so it's not. It's not a law. Mainly, it's it's so it's those things that it. I don't know how much it costs. I'll have to flip the invoice for you. We'll start there. Um, the um, reason that we do it is uh, really stems back to 2020 when we were getting three or four applications for people re registering for an absentee ballot. And it was actually uh, adding more work because we were having to process multiple applications for individuals. So this is kind of a fail safe. We send a postcard saying you're going to get a ballot. You don't need to apply for this election. Um, it's because that like we, were, we just get inundated with people that it's like you already have applied for a ballot. You don't need to. Oh, I misunderstood. I thought it was it's something saying you can get off. Yeah. Which yeah. doesn't make much sense because you don't yeah. want people to get off. Yeah, but it's one of those, like I said, it's the yeah dual yes. purpose. Of you're you're yeah. gonna get a ballot if you don't want to get a ballot. Tell us now. Um, but we've seen people come in with their postcard and their ballot, and they're like, I don't want to be on the list. And it's like, well, did you fill out the form? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Once again, the permanent absentee ballot list is new. Yeah. So yeah. so we are like I said, the more we can help educate voters about it, the better. Um, because there is still a somewhat a, con a confusion about how it works. So, yeah. I, I think I, if I can add that this issue came up in the General Assembly, and there were members of the Villages and Elections Committee who were reporting that they received many constituent inquiries about why they were receiving ballots. Yeah. And they had no, no expressed intent uh, that they recalled that they were on the list. Yeah. No, it, it is. There's been concerns in numerous sources. No, I just understood. I thought it was something saying, hey, you can get off. And I'm like, no, we don't want people. Okay, I yeah. see. I see your point. Thank yeah, you. but it's like I said, it's more like Education. you're getting this because you're on this list. If you, like I said, we're like I said, people are still they don't know how they got on it. They didn't want a ballot. They maybe they do want a ballot, but they don't need a request. Well, I think in a couple of rotations. They'll get it. But once again, we always have new voters in Arlington, so it's a new it's a new process every time somebody new comes into Virginia. Yeah. So I know we're going to be pulling out of Eric. Yes. How soon is that going to take an effect, and will that affect the Friday you know, counting of checking of provisional ballots or safety registration? Yeah. So yeah. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, we have pulled out of an error that was effective immediately. Um, that will not have any impact on the counting of provisional ballots because other state, like we're having a very a specific Virginia local primary. Um, so we wouldn't do uh, any kind of data cross check with other states and that same day registration process that within that 
the yeah, Canvas period anyway, any kind of data matching, any list maintenance activity in Virginia has to be done um, with that, like 60 days before an election. You cannot do list maintenance activities within 60 days of an election um, by code. The problem we'll see is next year. Yeah, that's what we're gonna. That's what yeah. we're gonna. Yeah, and uh, and 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 it's important to note that there. Once again, if you read the um, annual report on list maintenance, all of this is covered in there. Um, but Virginia is still required by statute to uh, attempt to enter into data sharing agreements with their neighboring with states that neighbor them. So in our cases, that is D.C., Maryland, Tennessee. Tennessee, we already um, I've talked to in the, three times in the last month. Um, so we are still very much in communication with states um, that aren't necessarily a part of ERIC. So, yeah. But instead of having a centralized source, it's now <coughs> down to these individual right. agreements. Makes everything harder and makes it yeah. 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 screws up the election integrity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the state is the one that has to enter into the agreements. Um, but the way uh, Virginia voter registration law works is only the registrar in that locality can approve or cancel a registered voter. So the information does need to be funneled down to us to, so the state will get the notice and then they'll send it to us to cancel that voter. Um, if you register to vote in Virginia, you indicate that you were registered in another state, the state will send that notice to the other state. That does cause some confusion because once again, Virginia's data privacy rules, we can't share full dates of birth. Um, so that was the last series of exchanges I had with Tennessee is they needed a full date of birth. I couldn't give it to them. So we had to figure out another way to help Tennessee identify the voter that they needed to cancel. Um, so, yeah. All of that because of their yeah. yeah. Tennessee's already crazy. I don't know that Tennessee was ever in it. No, yeah, it wasn't. Yeah. No, it wasn't. No, no, still. Yeah. Yeah. So, so once again, it is, it happens every month. Yeah. 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 Any other, any other questions yeah. from the, the phone call? Sorry, I think we safe. We didn't ask for the public safety. All right, well, I have seconded your motion. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Hey, Scott, we sent you a link to go into closed session. So if you can go into the meeting yes. called closed session, um, we will see you yes. there in a special <laughs> link. Thank you. The public is done. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, you. And that slide will be updated. <laughs> Let me mute here. Okay, so we are back in public session and we have an audience of nobody. No, thank you. So um, I move that the electoral board return to public session and certify that only public business matters lawfully exempt from open meeting requirements by Virginia law and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed session were heard, discussed, or considered. I second the motion to second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, so Aye. I am happy to announce um, that we have reappointed Gretchen Renmeyer as general registrar um, for another four-year term. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you so much. And your hard work in this office. Thank you. I'm delighted to be able to give another four years to Arlington County's voters. So there's still a lot of work we can do. So, yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and move that we adjourn the meeting. It is 6.47 p.m. Okay. I second that motion. Right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Enjoy your vacation, Scott. Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, sorry, I just cut him off. <laughs> <laughs> I just.